Here he comes, here he comes, there's the trumpet, there's the drums, here he comes, hark along Cassidy. Red Connors and I were riding deep in the heart of the Maricopa District in the Arizona Territory. In answer to a letter I had received from my old friend Nat Burnham, Indian agent in Phoenix. My thanks to you and Red for coming all the way from the Bar 20, Hoppy. All right, Nat. Whenever you send for us, we come a-running. Hey, sit down, Hoppy. Red. Thanks. Now, what's going on here? I've got a problem on my hands. Yeah? Do you remember the land deal the department arranged for the retired Army Indian Scout seven years ago? Well, you ought to, Hoppy. You ought to set it up. Uh, just a minute, Red. Let's see what Nat has to say. Since that time, the two tribes have lived together peacefully, side by side on their small farms until a month ago. Now it looks like they're bent on killing each other off. Well, Nat, knowing what I do about those two tribes, that doesn't seem possible. Let me tell you what happened. I had been friends with the chiefs of most of the members of the Maricopa and Apache tribes who had served with the scouts, and it wasn't a pleasant story to listen to. Four weeks ago, Chief Red Eyre of the Maricopa had been found on the outskirts of his ranch, shot to death. Several days later, Juanita, son of the Apache chief, had been found in the street in the nearby town of Mescal, an Indian knife in his back. Hey, Tex, bring your rig up here. All of this had been followed by the burning of the houses and barns of both sides. Cattle had been driven into the quicksands and left to die. Up to now, there have been three men of each tribe killed. Uh, once the Indians start trying to get even, they won't stop until there's not a man left. Oh, there's more of this than meets the eye, Red. I was with those two tribes when they took the oath of blood brotherhood. They wouldn't break that oath for anything. And what's your opinion, Hoppy? Well, I'm of the opinion that somebody's trying to run them off their land. Why would anybody do that? It's the poorest land in the district. They make a living only by the hardest work. Oh, mineral, oil, I don't know. There's never been a trace of either in the whole district. No, Hoppy, I think it's a feud. <laughs> now, I hate to be stubborn, but I'm going to stick to my own opinion. But you will go down there and see what you can do about it. Oh, sure. Just draw up my credentials and Red and I will be on our way. We were within a mile of Chief Red Arrow's ranch house when suddenly, ahead of us... Skull crease. We'll get him home and take care of him. Where do you live, son? Oh, about a mile up the road, Mr. Cassidy. Well, he knows you, Hoppy. I should. He's the best friend my father ever had. Well, you must be Tommy Red Arrow. That's right. Come on, give me a hand, Red. We'll get him home. That sting a little? No. Ah, <laughs> uh, there we are. Now you'll be as good as new. Thanks, Hoppy. It's foolish of me to ride into town alone. I might have known I would be next. You know, I can't get over it, Hoppy. Tommy talks even better English than me. <laughs> well, he should. He was an honor graduate from one of the finest Indian schools in America. There have never been any witnesses before. Did you get a good look at whoever it was who ambushed me? All we know is there was a couple of Indians. Is that true? Yeah, I'm afraid so, Tommy. I've been learning the ways of the civilized white man, and I like them. But if the Apaches have broken the oath of blood brotherhood, I'll... Now, wait a minute, Tommy. Don't do anything in a hurry. I know Chief White Cloud, too. I'm going over and have a talk with him. All right. I'll wait until I hear from you. Good. Red, you better stay here with him in case they try to finish off what they started. Oh, that won't be necessary, Hoppy. Now that I know I'm marked, I shall be on the alert. All right, suit yourself. And that thing is not sticking very good. There you are. There you go. Okay, come on, Red. Keep your eyes open, Tommy. I had a long talk with the chief, and he gave me his sacred word that neither he nor any of his tribe had anything to do with the trouble in any way. And knowing him, I believed him. 
I was sure now that outsiders were back of the whole thing, and the best place to begin my investigation was at the scene of the ambush. Here I found what I felt was definite evidence that white men had been involved in the ambushing of Tommy. The Apaches in this district all wore moccasins, and there were fresh prints of high-heeled western boots in the sand. And I was sure the Apaches didn't smoke turkey cigarettes. Back at Tommy's house, I had told him of my findings, and then I started asking questions. Has anyone been trying to buy up the Indians' land? Hoppy, have you forgotten? The grant of lands to us carried a clause that we could never sell them. Yeah, I know. That clause was put in so the Indians couldn't be cheated out of their land. And there's another clause that ties our hands so far as this present trouble is concerned. Yeah? If we leave the land, we'll be sent back to the reservations and our ranches will be sold to the highest bidders. Oh, I see. And I still insist you're being driven off the land. But why? Our places are none too prosperous. Maybe not as farms, Tommy. But there has to be some reason why they want this land. Were there any white men seen around here about the time the trouble started? No. What little business we transact is done in town. I see. There has to be somebody, I did. Oh, yes, there was a photographer who went around town taking pictures of the Indians to put on souvenir postcards. Harmless old man, half drunk most of the time. Calls himself Picture Pete. When was the last time you saw him? Today, in town. Uh, we better ride into town and have a talk with Picture Pete, huh? Yeah, maybe I can have my picture taken. Now, what are you going to do with that? Well, I'd, uh, I'd give it to you to keep. <laughs> They'll never get that on paper. Come on. The little town of Mescal was just a few miles from the Indian land. Be 25 cents. I'll have the pictures for you on Saturday. Thank you, my friend. Well, say, you look like the very spirit of the West. Would you mind posing for a photograph for me? Uh, maybe later. Right now, I'd like to have a little talk with you. I... Hey, Hobby, you darn good pictures of Indians, and you should see the pictures of the country. It looks just as natural. A very discriminating man, your friend. Yeah. yeah. I pride myself on my ability with a camera. Don't be frightened. That's not a snake, just a hair. I pride myself on my ability with a camera when I can stay away from this, uh, this boy. Esther, you know something? Use me as an example, my friend. You don't have to worry about me. I never touch this stuff. You know, your advice about keeping away from that stuff is pretty sound. Why don't you try using it yourself? No, oh, I've tried everything. Excuse me, will you please? I've got to finish talking to your friend over here. You know, you're wise in avoiding this stuff, my friend. Just look what it's done to me. At one time, I was recognized as one of the finest mineralogists in the whole country. Now, reduced to selling picture postcards for a living. But it isn't always going to be like that. No, sir. One of these days, and real soon, my ship is coming in. Coming in over those hills, young man. One of these days, I'll be one of the wealthiest men. Hey! That's my master's voice. What do you want, Constable Martin? I told you to stay off the street and in your room when you're drinking. Don't pay any attention to anything the drunken old fool says. Then I resent that attitude, Constable. I was just simply explaining to these gentlemen here. Get him out of here. Come on. Well, I... Hey. 
Hey, now, listen. All I was trying to do was... Uh, Go on. Please, Hoppy, let, let me take care of that no good. All right, go right ahead. Come on, get up. If you pick Bully, why don't you pick on somebody your size? Your friend's asking for it. You think so? You look about my size, Big Mouth. Pick that. Hey, you can't do that. Wait a minute. Let him alone. Your man started it. Now you're asking for it. How you doing, Red? Oh, fine. Somebody never learned this sidewinder not to lead with his right. <laughs> this one leads with his chin. <laughs> I'm going to run you two clear into the next county. I'm afraid that'll be a little difficult. According to this, take a look at it. Acting U.S. Marshal, working for the Indian agents. That's right, and Red Connors is my deputy. Cassidy, huh? <laughs> no wonder you're so handy with your fists. Sorry to cause you this trouble. Ah, uh, forget it. I think I'm going to have enough trouble keeping the Indians from killing each other off. Well, I'm glad somebody's here to look into things. Well, we're expecting them to turn on the whites any day now. I think they should be moved somewhere else. You really think so, huh? Yep. And if I can be of any help, you let me know. Yeah, I'll do that. Come on, Leeds. I got some business in the office. Hey, Hoppy. I just got old Pete headed back for his room to sleep it off. Ah, oh, that's good, Red. You know, I feel kind of sorry for a guy like that. Yeah. We're going to stick around here until he sobers up, then I'm going to have a little talk with him about mineralogy. Oh, sure, that's... Uh, hey, hey, Hoppy, there's a restaurant. You're not hungry again. Yeah, it always makes me hungry to fight. Did you call that a fight? Well, sure. <laughs> <laughs> then all you need is a cup of coffee. Come on, I can use one, too. Oh, Hoppy. Well, I guess that ought to hold me till supper time. Well, it should after that second steak you had for dessert. It was the hotel clerk, and he was telling his listeners that he had just found Picture Pete dead in his room. My credentials got me the number of Pete's room. Liquor would never be a problem to Pete again. The Indian knife in his back had done its work. Someone must have had a mighty good reason for wanting to silence Pete. I went through his belongings, hoping to find something that would tie him in with the Indian trouble. In his battered suitcase, I found samples of ore and a picture he had taken showing a range of hills. But what interested me most were the lines that had been drawn in the picture, making it a map of sorts. Now I was getting somewhere. The hotel hallway led to a back door that opened on an alley. Again, an expensive cigarette, freshly ground out. Well, he was killed with an Indian's knife. I knew it wouldn't be long before the Indians start killing the whites. You're getting a little ahead of yourself, aren't you, mister? I said he was killed with an Indian's knife. Marshal Cassidy, this is Mr. Rush, Mascal's leading businessman. How do you do? Marshal, something must be done about this whole business, or I shall demand that the government in Washington step in. Mr. Rush, in this particular case, I happen to represent the government. I'll decide what's to be done around here. Come on, Red, we're going out to see Tommy Red Arrow. Tommy, do you recognize that cliff where these lands converge here? Yes, Hoppy, that's what we call Lone Eagle Hill. Where is it? Well, here, take a look. It's the dividing line between our lands and the lands of the Apache neighbors. Let's ride up there and have a look. Sure.
Well, Tommy, there's the reason somebody wanted you off of this land. What do you mean, Hoppy? That is the biggest outcropping of copper ore I've ever seen. Probably worth a fortune. I've never seen this before. Last winter's rains must have washed away the surface dirt, exposing the veins. Yeah, it might have. Well, it's pretty easy to figure out now. Well, it ain't for me. Red, picture Pete said he was a mineralogist, didn't he? He was probably up in here looking for scenery to photograph and ran into this rich vein, realized the value of it. Well, now I get it. You go to town and get drunk and blabbermouth to somebody. That's exactly right. And I'll bet that somebody is a man that smokes turkey cigarettes. Let's get back to town. Come on. Back in town, my first move was to try to find out who around here smoked that brand of cigarettes. But the grocer was of no help. He didn't carry them. In the saloon, I had met with success. The bartender had told me that the only man in town who smoked the brand I had asked for was Judson Rush. Well, you can relax now, Mr. Rush. I've talked to both Tommy Red Arrow and uh, Chief White Cloud. They promised there'll be no more Indian trouble. Oh, cigarette, Marshal? No, thanks. How, uh, how well do you know the Indians around here, Marshal? Not too well. I thought not. If you did, you wouldn't trust them as far as you could throw a bull by the tail. Well, that may be true. But if they start any more trouble, I'll run them right off the land. See you later. Come on, Red. I had planted an idea in Rush's mind. My next move was to wait and see how he acted on it. From now on, I intended to watch every move Rush made. I had a hunch that sooner or later he would prove himself guilty. trio, a money-hungry man, a crooked constable, and a cold-blooded killer. led us to the shack just a short distance from Tommy's ranch. Red, I don't know what's going to happen here. You better get back to Tommy Red Arrows and tell him to get some of his friends together and be ready for anything. I'm going down close to that house, see what I can find out. Yeah, well, well, watch yourself, Hoppy. I will. You go ahead. The costumes cleared the Indians. It wouldn't be long now before the move would come that would prove all three of them guilty. Get your hands up, Marshal. All right, inside.
Look who I found sneaking around outside. And what did you see, Cassidy? Enough to prove that the Indians have been framed and by three of the lowest white men I've ever seen in my life. That's too bad. For you. I'll finish him off and then go after that big mouth partner of his. Now, now don't be in such a hurry, Leeds. You know, uh, this situation was made to order. Martin here will find Cassidy with a knife in his heart. And the Indians will be chased back to the reservation so fast their feet will smoke. Perfect plan, isn't it, Cassidy? All but the last part. It won't work. Why not? You don't think I'm stupid enough to walk into a spot like this without an ace in a hole, do you? He's bluffing, Rush. Let me be the judge of that. What is this ace in the hole? Probably the same thing you'd have done if you were in my spot. Well, come on, let's have it. My deputy knows everything about you three that I do. He's a Tommy Red Ayers right now. If I'm not there in 15 minutes, he'll go into town, tell the whole story, and organize a posse. I still think he's bluffing. You want to call my hand? Not unless I hold the stakes. We'll get rid of the Indian and the deputy first. And then uh, we'll take care of the marshal. Ah, oh, that's a brilliant decision. Let's go. Part of my plan had worked. Now, if Red and Tommy had carried out my instructions. Start walking. Just ahead was Tommy's ranch house. Hold it, Cassidy. Red's horse was tied at the hitch rack, so I knew he was somewhere around. Cassidy, just to make sure you don't try to yell any warnings, we'll stay here. I wouldn't think of trying to upset your plan. Martin, you leads one out of the house and get it over with. It'll be a pleasure. You can start walking. Everything all right, Hobby? Yeah. Here's fine. your hardware. I just brought you another customer. You might as well get out of that habit where you're going. There won't be any turkey cigarettes. Well, Tommy, you can help us get our prisoners to the federal jail, then we'll go tell our story to the Indian agent. All right, come on. Come on! After delivering the prisoners, we went to see Chief White Cloud. Now that the Indians had been cleared, peace was restored between the Maricopas and the Apaches. And the commissioner had promised Tommy he'd help get a government loan to finance work on their copper mine. If you were playing baseball and the baseball was knocked across a railroad track, I'm pretty sure when you got to that railroad track, you'd stop, look, and listen, wouldn't you? Now, please remember that any street in America is just as dangerous as that railroad. So when you get to the curbstone, 
Stop, look, and listen. Will you do that for me? Now, so long until next week. And in the meantime, don't forget to go to Sunday school. There he goes, on his way, down the moonlit trail to where cowboys lay. Hop along, Cassidy. Hop along, Cassidy. He'll return soon again. There's no use to say goodbye until then.